Hello and welcome back. So I'm going to make the first part of this video very brief and it's regarding the recent video I made about the GH6 having phase detect autofocus. Uh, that video got actually more attention than I hope. It's not huge, but uh, yeah, it went around. It made the rounds and uh, I just want to clarify a couple things and add a little bit to it. Um, yeah, I made a mistake about the G9 and the uh, dual pixel autofocus. So, you know, yeah, the truth is, honestly, uh, initially that crept into my head from Casey, aka Camera Conspiracies, uh, video. However, it was a little bit more than just that. And by the way, I'm going by script today because there's quite a bit I want to say today. Uh, again, the, the first part's going to be short, so hang in here. Um, but I don't like to go on script, honestly. Uh, I prefer just to kind of free flow. But I want to make sure I don't miss anything today. So, put simply, uh, my life is pretty much non-stop, and I don't really think I actually watched the whole video of Casey's uh, before I went to my full-time job. Uh, but shortly after that, I did talk to somebody, and yeah, it was a magical camera key creature, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, so anyways, I was primarily talking about the GH6 and some of what we talked about, but uh, I casually mentioned the G9 and I was basically just saying that, you know, this is one of my all-time favorite cameras. I've never actually owned one, but first, you know, it's, it's always been very tempting to me, um, especially after they added the 10-bit. Anyways, I just casually uh, said something like, it's nice that the autofocus has gotten updated and you know the person nodded and agreed and then i i said because that was fresh in my head i said basically oh yeah the dual pixel now right and i'm guessing he didn't hear me clearly you know he got a kind of a little bit of a confused look on his face and nodded but i don't think that was a confirmation at the time i took that as a confirmation because you know again i just been busy with my work schedule saw the video with casey or saw the title anyways and incorporated that into my conversation. It's a mistake, mistakes happen. If you don't like it, deal with it. Go find another channel where mistakes never happen. Um, so anyways, that, that's basically what happened there. Um, and uh, so yeah, I just assumed, you know, or he probably just assumed that I'd said something else that actually made sense and him being Japanese, me being not Japanese, you know, it just, it's one of those, again, like I said, loss in translation, it happens. Uh, so, Mr. Bob. I want to be clear though, regarding phase detect on the GH6, this is a multiple source thing, and believe me or don't, uh, these were much lengthier conversations, and I asked several times in each case for confirmation that it was indeed phase detect that we were talking about. Uh, no, it wasn't a miscommunication about phase detect. Face detect. <laughs> uh, Panasonic has already had face detect for, I don't know, like 10 years or something. It's also important to note that I've been pestering to a fault regarding face detect with the people that I do talk to. Uh, now, I'm going to briefly touch on what I also said about the resolution being more than 5.7K. Uh, in a moment, but first I want to give a shout out to a new channel I just subscribed to called MFT Raw. Uh, I actually found this guy's channel, uh, sorry I don't know your name dude, but I found his channel because uh, he'd actually mentioned uh, my video and uh, linked some clips from my video of the GH6 leak. Uh, and besides, besides this guy doing what I thought was a pretty good job of being impartial regarding my statements, uh, I was also impressed with the professionalism on his channel. Anyways, thanks again to MFT Raw, um, and I'll be keeping an eye out for your videos. Uh, I like your style. So not to the level of MFT Raw, but I did used to put a bit more effort into my videos, and I'll be telling you a bit more about myself in a bit if you feel like sticking around. But first, regarding the nearly 8K resolution of the GH6 I touched on, uh, first let me be clear, uh, this is neither confirmed by me or by any of the magical creatures I've spoke with, it was said as maybe. Now something to note in Japan is when someone says maybe, it can mean no. <laughs> it can mean like yeah, yes, definitely. Um, and it can mean maybe. And it can also mean all these little shades in between. Um, 
and it's something that until you've lived in Japan for several years or more it's really hard to kind of read the different maybes uh, in this case what I heard would have been what I call a 70% yes <laughs> but the thing is because he did say 7.7 .7 or 7.8 uh, K resolution uh, I in the back of my head I'm still wondering if he meant to say 5.7 or 5.8 K that being said there is some plausibility to it maybe being 7.7 .7 or 7.8 K resolution uh, now I know very well that 5.7 K and 10 bit resolution was the information Panasonic put out there uh, and even though I'm not so sure we'll see above 5.7K resolution, I will first say basically what MFT Raw said and regarding my statement on that. And, you know, he, he admitted that, you know, it cast some doubt into my credibility, which is fine. Again, take it or leave it. I mean, I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying, you know, why should you believe me? You know, I'm just this guy that I don't have a lot of views. And even if I did, you know, anyone can say anything on, especially on YouTube. But what MFT Raw said is that the GH5 has 6K anamorphic mode, or open gate, which is also something Panasonic full frame cameras, some of them have. And I also think you should consider that the GH6 is going to do 5.7K 60P in 10 bit. So what that means is, forgetting about sensor resolution for a moment, the processing power is there and it should be okay doing 8K at a slower frame rate, uh, maybe in 10-bit and surely in 8-bit, or maybe it has some other tricks up its sleeve. Traditionally, if a camera can do 60p in 10-bit at X amount of res resolution, there's going to be something above that. Maybe it's just that we're going to see raw 12-bit 5.7K at 60p, but just to tickle your 8K bones a little bit here, 8K on a Panasonic Micro Four Thirds sensor is not something that Panasonic has never planned before. Actually, now I might get this slightly wrong, so slam me in the comments if you want, but before the GH5 came out, or maybe it was right after, I think it was before, Panasonic had planned an 8K Micro Four Thirds sensor with an electronic ND filter using some sort of organic film uh, a material uh, on the sensor which when exposed to electrical current changed the intensity of the filter and definitely don't quote me on this last bit but I think they may have also said something about it being a global shutter sensor the thing is a lot of relatively new people don't know or or maybe just don't remember but before people using cameras uh, Panasonic specifically were clamoring for 8k or f even 4k Many that were pure artists, or at least trying to make pure artistic content, and not just videos about video specs uh, before the content had evolved into what it is now, uh, we were asking for global shutter. So in fact, I still would rather have a 1080p global shutter with 480 frames per second ideally, <laughs> but over a 4K or 8K sensor, honestly. Uh, maybe I'll leave that rant for another day though and why that is, but uh, the official reason Panasonic abandoned the 8K sensor was difficulty, uh, but many speculated Sony was trying to jack them for the price. Uh, and that was back when most were still using the $800 GH2 or maybe the slightly more expensive GH3, and some people were now using the GH4. But it stands to reason that a $2.5,000 camera now has the budget for the once exotic overpriced sensor. So maybe Panasonic is just pulling that old sensor off the shelf and putting it in on the production queue. Uh, who knows, really, but it's, it's possible. That sensor was supposed to be something special. Even though it's all exciting and 8K would be exciting for its own reasons, the uh, phase detect obviously has some very serious implications. Honestly, though, me personally, you know, just so you guys understand that it's not like me just getting hyped up about this. I personally am very unlikely to buy the GH6 uh, no matter what the specs are. And the only thing that actually could tempt me, in fact, is a global shutter, I think. Now, <laughs> I think that's probably the only thing that could tempt me. You know, I've been known to eat my words, but I don't think so this time. Uh, so, 
granted, Panasonic has very low rolling shutter compared to most, especially on their Micro Four Thirds sensors. But I film a lot of trains, bikes, and you know, stuff in Tokyo that's just moving fast. Uh, and I've been dreaming a very long time of slow motion with vertical lines on fast moving trains and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of what, I, if I'm going to go back to Micro Four Thirds, probably it's going to be something with a global shutter, which there, there are a few options out there now. Uh, Zcam, um, I think actually maybe just one Micro Four Thirds option and a couple APS-C ca cameras out there. Zcam and I think uh, Red Com Komodo, there might be one or two others though. So anyways, uh, it's also important to say though, the 8K organic sensor is a good example of how production plans do shift, uh, but I sincerely doubt that they're gonna ditch their plans for phase detect, especially with the information coming out so recently. Yes, for me, as far as you guys are concerned, but again, you either believe me or you don't, it's fine, I get it. I, I think I released that leak video again, I just didn't think it was gonna be as far reaching and I thought, you know what, just, I'm just kinda like throwing that to, I guess, the believers, those that just know, uh, I don't know how they know, but just I, I just have a feeling that like some people are just going to know when I tell them this is the truth, and they'll be stoked, and maybe rather than spending their hard-earned money, uh, I think that's what it is, really, I was looking at the budget people, because honestly, those of you with a bunch of money to throw at and buy you know new cameras every three months, cool, but you're not really uh, my intended audience, I'm sorry. <laughs> feel free to subscribe right now, but uh, yeah, no, I just, look, I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've never had a very big budget. I mean, the biggest budget I ever had was probably when I bought, uh, well, actually, it's probably when I was building. Oh, we haven't got to that yet. Mm, we're getting to that. But, uh, you know, as far as cameras go, the Z6, and, you know, I bought a couple decent lenses for that, and I'm going to put more into the Nikon camera system probably before I switch to anything else, and we'll get into that. That's actually a video. There's a video coming. Or maybe I am switching cameras. Damn it, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, I'm off script now if you can't tell. It's better, right? Maybe, maybe not. Back to the script. I scroll up so it almost looks like I'm making your eye contact. Um, anyways. So, actually, so that's sorry. So, for those that just wanted the GH6 information, I'm sorry that last 30 second or one minute rant was unneeded for you to listen to because that does conclude the GH6 part of the video. Uh, so, if you want to stick around for a few more minutes, probably more like five or 10 minutes, maybe if I can. Anyways, I'm going to explain a little bit about who the fuck I am. So, here you go. And again, it's scripted because it's just too much. I moved to Japan 10 years ago. No. So I moved to, ten, to Japan uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago now, actually, and it was just days after the massive earthquake uh, tsuna slash tsunami slash nuclear melt through. Uh, for the record, meltdowns, are, I believe, are when they're contained within the structure. That's not what happened at Fukushima. They melted through, which means the nuclear material uh, melts through the facility into the earth and where it's continuing to presumably at this point, I know years after, I mean, they just stopped talking about it basically, but presumably it's still melting slowly through basically till it meets magma or the core of the earth or whatever. Um, anyways, I was literally the only semi-white person uh, coming in to the airport that was actually arriving that day. There was several people leaving, going out the other way, but it was me. That was it, at least for the couple hour period that I was in the airport. Um, I even had a policeman approach me and tell me that if I could, I should probably leave because the, especially in Narita, the levels were very high. Um, and I actually, I, I haven't checked. I'm curious. I should go back. I have a very fancy little dosimeter slash Geiger counter. I should go back and check what the levels are now. And they're still fairly much the same in Tokyo, though. They never really fell. It's a bunch of bullshit. It's, <laughs> Lady Gaga said, it's safe. And everyone started believing it was safe. That was like seven years ago. It's bullshit. Uh, it, it's still relatively high nuclear levels, no matter what they tell you. Um, it's basically the yearly limit, like before they changed the law after Fukushima. They changed what those, anyways, I, I digress. Convenient bullshit was what that was. Anyways, so, <laughs> so, uh, but anyways, I, I arrived here and, you know, um, 
it was a bit sad, but it was, and a bit scary coming to Japan at that time, uh, especially with magnitude seven plus aftershocks pretty much daily for months, and notably big like six point oh ish average, maybe aftershocks for at least a year, and aftershocks. I mean, definitely weekly continued for three or four years. Uh, I would say, um, and yeah, it, it, it was crazy. Um, but there was also sort of a strange beauty. Um, my bus actually arriving uh, it took me from Narita out to West Tokyo, where I live. And because of the problems, uh, basically all the lights were off in Tokyo. I mean, when I say basically, I mean really all the lights were off in Tokyo. And uh, a lot of people were just without power anyways. Um, but. Yeah, and I kept looking out the bus window, like trying to make out landmarks, things I might recognize, Tokyo Tower, or, you know, just some of the lights of Shibuya or something like that. And basically nothing except for a few street lights, uh, I think just for public safety. But, but there's one thing that was just very, very notable was when I got kind of the Yokohama area, I looked out the window and there was just this huge tower with a massive, and I'm, when I say massive, I mean way bigger than my house and I have a pretty big house a uh, flame just shooting out of the top of the tower I think it was like a, it, was, it was either an oil refinery or more likely I think it was a gas works and maybe working a little overtime uh, pumping a little extra fuel to to make up for the lack of energy since they weren't running the nuclear generators anyways so yeah that was really interesting and uh you know, it, it kind of made me realize I was coming to J Japan in a very, uh, special is not quite the right word, but, you know, I realized that, hey, they might even close, you know, all the radiation was scary enough that I thought maybe they were going to actually close down Tokyo. It would become like a ghost city, um, which is ironic given the times now. But, yeah. Um, Oh yeah, I'm going back to that flame that was so vivid because there was no lights. I mean, I could, the other thing is I could see stars. and I ha You can't see stars in Tokyo usually, at least not very many. But you could see like the whole sky and then this huge gas ball. So anyways, being in Japan alone uh, would have been enough to inspire me, I think. But I thought that because it was a very unique time for better or worse for Japan, that I, I, I should probably get a really good camera. Um, you know, the best that I had ever had, which was the GH2. And I sort of had free reign as I was basically the only foreigner in my area for several months uh, at least. And people seemed to be really happy just to be able to talk with a foreigner. And they didn't seem to carry that I was carrying a camera around everywhere and taking video and photos of everything. Unfortunately, a lot of those videos are stuck on some hard drives which need uh, repair. So power units, basically, they're, they're still Still, the files should still be good, but I do need to get around to repairing those some days. Um, but I'm going to do my best to find some of the other hard drives uh, and get some of the stuff off those and maybe share some of that because I've been meaning to go down memory lane for a long time. So anyways, because I chose the GH2, or rather why I chose the GH2, was because I came across a website called Personal View, and the webmaster is a Russian man named... I'm always probably butchering this, but Vitaly Kiselev. Kiselev. <laughs> and uh, this guy had put a ton of work with the help of some other community members on that website, truly tech-savvy people, by the way, uh, into hacking or patching, if you want to say it that way, the firmware of the GH2, uh, basically creating a new uh, version of the firmware. So it was really clear to me when I'd found this website that the hack was going to happen really soon. And I just went on that leap of faith and I purchased the GH2. And sure enough, within a week of actually buying the uh, GH2, which I, which I also bought within a week of finding the site. So a week later though, after I bought the GH2, the hack was complete and they released the first uh, version with, you had, to put a P, you had to put P tools on your computer. Anyways, there's a process. Uh, I haven't done it in a while, but it's not that hard. And basically, you just load it on a memory card and put it in your camera, and just like updating the firmware you normally would. And it, yeah. So I took a deep breath and I did it, and it worked. And basically, it took what was basically an, a typical at the time video image out of a camera or camcorder and instantly transformed it in a much higher detail, rock solid 
kind of cinema-esque, <laughs> uh, kind of black magic before black magic uh, image. And what it did basically at that beginning stage is it took what in the original release was a 15 megabit per second uh, video uh, quality, bit rate, sorry, anyways, and made it 60 megabits per second, if I remember correctly, 60 or 70, something like that. And soon after that, other site members, uh, Driftwood most notably, I believe L. Powell is another guy's name, started creating their own custom patches, and many with uh, custom colors, you might almost call them LUTs, and specific purposes like dusk time or dawn, broad daylight, low light, um, sports. And some of these patches actually got up to, uh, originally they were in like the 150 megabit per second range, which on a 1080p sensor, if you want to do the math, that's like a 600 megabit uh, per second on a 4K. I mean, this was 10 plus years ago. So, and there was actually even some that topped about 170. I think there might have been one or two that almost reached 200 megabits per second. They started having trouble, which was originally thought to be with the memory card write speed. I believe they decided in the long or eventually that it wasn't, although that was a limitation at that time, that there were also internal limitations. But the 170 megabit per second ones did work, but they would usually record for only like 10 seconds before the camera would uh, cancel the recording. So, but what, it was great for me because I was, you know, an impatient uh, newbie at this all and I was recording everything, but it forced me to do these little 10 second, basically I would count down, you know, and before 10 seconds stop the recording to make sure it saved the file. So it taught me to uh, to be conservative and choose my shots. And it's something I've actually still struggling to get back to because, you know, I don't have that limit now, obviously. Uh, I'd say it's something to recommend to other people though. Try that. Try just like limiting all your shots to 10 seconds because if you look at any commercial, uh, it's rarely over two, three second shots. Anyways, I'm off script, but I think that's good to know. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah. Again, by now today's standards, like especially the low light on the GH2 is nothing impressive. But at that time, even like a lot of industry professionals uh, that frequented that site, it was definitely the heyday of that site. Uh, I still recommend visiting personalview.com, personal-view.com. Anyways, a lot of industry pro professionals uh, on that site, uh, you know, they were even blown away by that. Um, that this little micro four thirds sensor was giving such great light, low light uh, results. So I kept using the GH2 for years and I still own it though it's LCD ribbon uh, cable broke after I think about seven years and it's, it's unusable now until I tackle that. It's a fairly small project, I just have to order that. So basically though, what I wanna say about uh, that and personal view and its creator is that the place we're at right now with cameras, um, we wouldn't be at this level right now if it wasn't for that website, especially regarding video specs. You can thank the Russian for that, okay? <laughs> I don't always agree with him and his politics, uh, but he did a really a great service for us, uh, for us otaku, by hacking that camera. But basically, he forced the camera industry to step on the gas and accelerate things. Uh, and there's no doubt in my mind we would not be, we'd probably be like three, four years behind at best but it should be known by all creators and maybe some thanks and even maybe some donations should be given to personalview.com and a lot of professional information there. You can learn a lot from some serious professionals about the actual craft. After about three years of using the, the GH2, um, before it broke, I was starting to get into drones, uh, really interested in them. I never really liked the DJI stuff. Uh, I didn't like the idea of just buying something that was ready to go. and it had a reputation, you know, a lot of people bought it, didn't know how to use it, lost their drone, other things happened, and there's some hysteria basically created out of that. So instead of going that route, I first built myself a 550 millimeter, very basic drone. <laughs> it had some in some motors that were ridiculously overpowered for it, but it flew. Um, it, was a, you know, it was a hexacopter and yeah, it's a mad amount of power. So it only had about six or seven minute battery life at best but actually did give me some very stable, for that time period, uh, footage. I got some cool stuff. That was way before, like, in Japan especially, there was, no one even knew what a drone was, basically. People would be like, nani, nani? I was like, what's that? Um, but uh, after that, though, uh, you know, I, I really quickly decided I wanted to build something better and lighter, too. I built two 600 millimeter 
680 millimeter uh, camera, specific drones. Uh, both were carbon fiber. One was a hexacopter, one was a quadcopter. And uh, the quadcopter is still very, very flyable right now. The hexacopter, I switched out the motors and haven't got back around to rebuilding it. Um, but they're both really good machines. I was really happy with how they turned out. And I learned so much. You know, I used, uh, I didn't go with DJI, although I have a DJI flight controller. I used on one of them once and it crashed and broke an arm. Um, sorry, DJI, but it's true. Um, I went with Eagle Tree and eventually Pixhawk. And then I also started building uh, some, I built a couple mid sized camera drones, so just a little bit lighter weight. And then I built a small army of FPV drones, uh, some racers rather. And although I did get some nice shots with the drones, it was kind of about the same, so same time that the world started their government media fed drone phobia and eventually came to Japan to uh, they staged an event where they pretended that somebody landed a, a drone on top of the prime minister's house with some very very minuscule amount of radioactive material anyways uh, so yeah the laws began to change and it became a lot more difficult to test my creations uh, I continued to build FPV racers for a few years and I got really into like the art of making them like as tidy as possible and fast as fuck uh, my last two FPV racers that I built uh, were able to do about uh, one was about 150 miles per hour and the other was 170 miles per hour uh, respectively so that's on paper and I don't have a radar gun and also it's really hard to find a stretch long enough in Japan to try full fro th throttle full tilt punches. Uh, I've flown both though and I can say from one side of a baseball field to the other it's about one second flat with pretty much both of them. And if you think I'm bullshitting these are those two. Um, this one is double frame it's basically two frames put together to make this indestructible pretty much you could pretty much fly this at 100 miles per hour into a tree and for the most part it would say it, it would survive <laughs> uh this one is just well this is probably i would say one and a half frames it's it's been reinforced in critical places but for the most part it's one frame and i don't know it's, it's probably not an apt analogy but you think of this the motors on this is like a four stroke this one's a little bit more uh, powerful but not as high RPMs as this. Uh, this is these are these motors are ridiculous. Um, yeah, they both are ridiculous. But this this thing here, I'm not going to go into all the specs on these. But I built these specifically to be as strong and streamlined with everything tucked inside. Even with the camera, if you can see that is put so that it, you could smash the camera if you hit just right. But but it's going to be hard for that camera to fall off or come out of the, the machine itself if you crash. Um, you'd have to do pretty crazy things to break these. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So, and they're also built for easy access. Like I have thumb screws in the bottom to take off the whole top canopy on this one um, to get to the power distribution board, which right underneath that is actually the flight controller. Anyways, I'm not going to nerd out on drones for you today. but. I'm pretty proud of those. They're pretty damn nice machines. And uh, both of them, you know, it, it was a labor of love. I mean, I spent almost a year on one of those, not building, but rebuilding and redesigning and trying to make everything perfect. I just got OCD on that. So anyways, um, where are we going here now? Okay, so there's a lot of other stuff, uh, obviously, that has happened to me since I've been in Japan. Uh, I had a child. I almost died. I, I spent 10 days in the hospital almost dying. And after buying a Nikon Z6, I spent a solid year doing street photography before watching the world go into shutdown. Uh, and then after that, I spent about another solid year primarily doing nature photography, which I was always more at home doing, uh, probably because I came from a place in the middle of a deep forest. Uh, and most of my life, I've lived either near nature, uh, the ocean, or in nature. Uh, so, and I spent a lot of time in the ocean, so, yeah. Japan never really fully shut down. Uh, and just recently, it's gotten to the point where most shops are closed by 8 p.m. Um, and I see it steadily shutting down more and more, we'll see. Um, but I'm kind of at a crossroads right now and I'm looking to do what I wanna do, uh, or looking rather for what I wanna do from now on until I'm basically too old to do it. Uh, I truly enjoy photography and videography. 
but it's always been kind of difficult for me to market myself in Japan, uh, primarily because my Japanese is sadly, after 10 years, still very poor. I never actually wanted to be a YouTuber, but after several years of pestering me, I finally agreed to help Personal View cover CP Plus in Yokohama, Japan. I did this in 2018 and 2019, and though it was interesting, and in fact, I was able to do a closed do door interview with Panasonic themselves in 2018, uh, the pace of CP Plus is not something that I enjoy doing, and the noise level there, I, I just, it's not my thing. That's way too much noise in a closed space. It's basically unbearable for me. In the second year, I actually wore some of those, uh, the, what do you call them, noise isolation headphones. So, so yeah. Uh, regarding the interview with Panasonic, though, uh, although he was not present during the interview, Inoue-san, uh, was one of my first contacts with Panasonic, and he, along with one of the gentlemen I interviewed, who, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, um, but he was there too, they, they both lent me out two G8s, or actually one G85 from the U.S. and one G8 from Japan, same cameras, different name, uh, for testing and filming during CP+. So the interview, and, and because I was going to interview them, the interview was, which uh, I'll link below, is kind of funny as it was sort of translated by me from English that the Russian founder of Personal View made, and his questions were really harshly worded and very matter-of-fact, uh, to put it mildly. <laughs> Uh, so some, uh, some of the questions I actually just left the way they were because I wanted to see the Panasonic uh, team members' reaction and also because sometimes less than perfect English plays well when you're in an international crowd of people who also don't speak native English. And a little bit for my own entertainment. I wanted, just kind of wanted to see what happened because some of the questions were kind of hilarious, at least to me at the time. Uh, the thing is though, the actual transcript I made uh, during the interview was reinterpreted by Vitilia, Vitili Kessler. <laughs> and then there were some redactions made after the initial publishing by Panasonic. Uh, nothing major, but I think they wanted to make sure they didn't come off harsh themselves, a couple things they said. And I don't remember each thing that was redacted, but there were, there were some redactions. It was actually much more revealing for me than anyone else, anyone that got to read the interview, uh, even the unredacted version, as there were things said which I had to promise not to quote them on, and also things I can't quite explain, but it's sort of like I said earlier, where in Japan, maybe can mean yes, no, maybe, or any level in between and something you just have to be in Japan long enough to know. That's where I was starting to key into that, I think. So basically, uh, the interview, though it was a great experience, uh, I, I got the impression soon after, uh, well, actually before that, the upper management was not comfortable at all with me doing the interview, and though there have been meetings since then, I've not been allowed to do any official interviews since. In fact, the 2018, and I know a lot of you guys are going to slam me because you're going to read that interview and you're going to be like, well, duh. But trust me, there's more to it than that. The 2018 interview was originally supposed to be a video interview, uh, but because I was green and I was given very little instructions by personal view and simply assumed they knew exactly who Mr. Kisselev <laughs> was, I discussed the patches he had made for the GH2 during my first contact, because this was already several years after that, and I was sure that they were well aware of the work that had been done to, to up the bit rates. And I discussed that with them the day that the interview was supposed to take place when I first met with Inoue-san and his counterpart. So after that, the interview was, we'll say postponed, but it really it was canceled. and. It was only after me stopping by their booth every time that first day that I made a full circle during my interviews and stopping by early the next morning before the public doors had opened. You know, you gotta love press passes. <laughs> but I was finally able to secure the interview, at least verbally, which I didn't realize till the last moment was gonna be behind closed doors and not only behind closed doors, but I wasn't allowed to record video or audio. So thus, I had to fumble for scraps of paper and the pen to get what I got. 
So beyond specs and company, and I did consider turning on a tape recorder, but out of respect, I didn't. But beyond the specs, though, and the company direction that I saw them heading in, what I really got from the meetings with Panasonic was that the guys making the cameras are truly great guys and very capable of making great cameras. They take great pride in each creation and not just the camera, but the specific features of the camera. Um, they were really proud to tell me, you know, I did this on this camera, I did this on that camera, you know, and I really wish that was, that was kind of pre-interview and post-interview and I really wish that was actually, rather than trying to dig for information or, you know, the agenda of personal view, which I respect what he was doing there, but I would have liked to have more done an interview, just, just kind of getting to know the guys themselves and more about that and the things that they did want to share. And I'd like to get back to that someday. So Panasonic, if you are listening, if you're not pissed about me leaking the phase detect, <laughs> I really would like to, I'd like to sit down with you guys and do, I'll do a scripted, more professional, I'll give you the, the, the questions. Um, so anyways, Mr. Inoue was kind enough to meet with me during the last CP Plus as well, uh, before COVID, COVID had shut it down uh, to a virtual event last year. And he introduced me to his successor because actually that was his last year of not just CP Plus, but as far as I could tell, working for Panasonic. Unfortunately, my subsequent attempts to contact his replacement have gone unanswered. And since this was Inoue's last year at Panasonic before retiring, I snuck some footage of Inoue-san uh, as he toured me around the Panasonic booth uh, looking for his replacement to introduce me. Uh, he was carrying the then new S1 camera, and you know it's just something about that guy. I really like that guy. Uh, he's got a style, a subtle style to him, and everyone knew him, and you could tell that he was both respected uh, and just liked by everyone that saw him. Everyone smiled and was just happy to see him. I think. I wish I would have gotten to know him a little bit better while he was with Panasonic, and maybe someday we can have a drink, you know, Asan. Uh, it's be my treat. Kampai. So I think that will wrap this up for now. Uh, I have a lot more I could tell you about my life here, but it's just going to go on and on and on. So for now, I just want to say, though, I like Panasonic. I really do. I'm on hiatus from Panasonic cameras at the moment. And as I said in my last few video, it's primarily because of the autofocus. But during my hiatus, I went full frame and I went Nikon. And though I may someday buy another Micro Four Thirds dedicated to video, uh, it needs to basically be my dream camera at this point, and that means global shutter. And I think that they're they're holding back the ability of Micro Four Thirds sensors. I think that they can do a lot better in low light. I think they they I think they did some research. This is something else. This is just a little hypothesis based on a little bit of what I've heard. I think that they took the research to a new level uh, at the time of the GH4, before the GH5 came out, and I think they did, whatever the reason is, they, they sort of halted. And yes, this is sort of based around that sensor I discussed, but there's a little more to it, I think. They sort of halted the development for various reasons, which I'm not going to go into right now, but I think the Micro Four Thirds sensor was, let's just say it was capable of giving full frame a run for its money at that point and that's part of why I think it was shut down kind of so let's see it go the other way let's see micro four thirds come back out because you can bring that technology likely into the full frame sensors now and keep things even so to speak um, so yeah I do see that phase detect is gonna be a very good thing on the GH6 and it also is because it means full frame is likely gonna have it in the Panasonic L mount ecosystem and, you know, Sigma FP already did that, so it shouldn't be that much of a shock. Um, and I think that also uh, we'll see the lenses start to meet a more consumer-friendly price point. Uh, and lenses that are phase detect specific are going to start coming out. Uh, so, yeah. So lastly, I want to say that regardless of what camera system I or you use, uh, cameras and their lenses are or should be tools for expressing art and capturing memories. I think at a time uh, where I have a rare opportunity here to show Japan during a very unusual time again in history, uh, 
it's something that I almost have a responsibility, I feel, to do. And I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do that and which, which aspects of Japan I want to focus on. But I think that not only is it an unusual time in Jap Japanese history again, but this time, unlike my earth-shaking beginnings here, the whole world can very much relate to Japan's current situation. And maybe that's something I can somehow create a visual connection for between the world and here. And maybe connect people, you know, just give them a sense of connection worldwide through these trying times that we haven't really had before as a world. Maybe I'm shooting too high there, but I, I feel there's something, probably a little bit more elegantly spoken if I wasn't uh, getting a sore throat and trying to finish this up. I'm still not sure exactly where this channel is going to be heading, but maybe it's okay if it's just a hodgepodge of life in Japan and camera-related stuff for now. I welcome all respectful comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to see the three times translated transcript of my interview with Panasonic in 2018, uh, the link is below and maybe up here, um, maybe, no, I guess maybe I couldn't figure that out. Or could I? Nope. And by the way, the names of the Panasonic representatives I spoke with in the interview are Michi Haru Uematsu, uh, who was the Panasonic technical consultant at the time, Masanori Koyama, who was Panasonic assistant chief of DSC product planning at the time, and Tetsuji Kamio, uh, who was the Panasonic GH line te development team uh, head, I believe, or just on the team, I'm not sure. Um, likely some of their positions have changed and something else I'd mention there is that a lot of them are they, they came up through camera development that's the other thing that was really impressive to me is like a lot of the head guys there they were they came up through development they knew the cameras very well and what went into them but anyways thanks for watching I really do appreciate it. if you're watching this and you got anything from this video give it a thumbs up if you hate it, go ahead, give it a thumbs down. I know there's more people that don't like my videos than do like my videos at this point. And I'm sure I'd like to see that change, but you know, it doesn't really bother me much. And I kind of get amusement out of the, the asshole comments, so go ahead, be a dick. <laughs> and once again, again, peace out, take it easy.